Okay, so for this particular video, we will be looking at topic 3.3 of Cluster 2 Tourism. Okay, so this portion here, we will be dealing with the first bit on how effective uh, approaches in achieving sustainable tourism development, right? So there are three key approaches to sustainable tourism development. Okay, these three uh, key approaches, when they, the point where they all intersect, the Goldilocks point, is where you will hopefully be able to see that if you are in this midpoint uh, of these three approaches, you will be able to then have sustainable tourism development in the long run and yeah, for the foreseeable future. So what are these three things that we're looking at? One of which is of course the use of ecotourism as a as a core form, okay, as a core approach towards this. Um to to support this, there are two other approaches that commonly come in. One is uh, called community-based tourism. So not only do you do it in the ecotourism uh, ethos, you also bring in the community uh, so that the tourism manner in itself is self-sustaining. But more, uh, more increasingly, you also see, because when you're looking at sustainable tourism development, you do want to um, up-level everybody. And one key component that will continue to help push this is the poor. So if you have a form of Poor, pro poor tourism, which is actually part of community based tourism, right? Pro poor community based eco tourism. This is your magic spot in the middle. Okay, so this is what we're looking for. So, first and foremost, we will be looking at effectiveness of eco tourism. Okay, eco tourism in itself, uh, the approach is diverse, right? And there are there is a sort of like a spectrum, okay, from the very from hard go tourism to soft go tourism. Now, the second thing that you need to remember is besides being lying on this spectrum, which is sometimes a hard, not always very clear as where this form of go tourism that you're proposing would lie on. Uh, the other thing is also longevity, right? Uh, the uncertainty, right? Over the continuing, the ability to continue to have this intensity of efforts in conserving nature is uncertain. There are factors that will change. Local conditions may change. Environmental conditions may change. Your government may change. And as a result, all these things will have an impact on longevity. Always remember, there are so many factors that can impact the longevity and the effectiveness of uh, implementing ecotourism. Okay, government funding, right? Climate may change. Okay, and other physical factors. These are all things that we have to take into consideration when we're looking at. Uh, the idea of longevity of ecotourism, right? So what exactly is ecotourism? What can be considered ecotourism? It, number one has to be sustainable tourism. And secondly, ecotourism it has to exist in natural areas. Okay? This is a very important thing. So with that in mind, right, if you think about Singapore as a, as a tourism destination, are there places where we can actually truly claim to be able to do ecotourism? Right, if you visit the marshlands in Sungai Bulo, is it technically a natural area? Okay, or is it a man-made area? Right? Uh, does does it then have an impact in terms of the conception of the idea of ecotourism? If you are going to visit a man-made natural area, okay, so this is very, very, very sketchy, and as a result, like in many case studies, uh, warnings that we've issued before, try not to use Singapore if you're looking at ecotourism. They try not to, it's really sketchy and it's very hard to explain clearly why these uh, areas that you may propose are actually well, possible to be considered as ecotourism sites. Okay? But generally, right, what we're looking for is not only natural areas, but the experience is one where you're looking at the scenic nature okay? and you're there to experience the nature itself. So there are also, um, if you look very carefully, some ecotourism companies in Singapore that bring um, tourists into mangrove areas, okay, kayaking through the mangroves in the Pongo waterway area, kayaking the mangroves in Pulau Ubin. Um, think back to your journey uh, that many of you went for in OBS when you went back Sec 3. Okay, so this that those areas, right? Uh, if you are not on OBS, not forced to be there, uh, you are on a ecotourism tour and you are brought to Pulau Ubin to experience the nature, to walk through the mangroves. Would that consider? I I that would easily be considered as a form of ecotourism. Okay, 
Now, the other things that we're looking for, we're looking at ecotourism, you tend to have a requirement where you're benefiting the local community that is in the area. Okay, so a long-term incentive would be then there for these local people to maintain this overall environment and to maintain this process that allows them to continue to earn uh, ecotourism dollars for the long run. So this is important. Okay, so long-term, uh, involve the locals, right? So what are we doing now? Uh, I want to cut out to a video. Okay, this video is once again available in the YouTube channel as well. Right, this is uh, how they successfully built community-based ecotourism in Sabah, Malaysia. Okay, this is not Peninsula Malaysia, this is East Malaysia, Sabah itself. So let's listen in. Kampung Tajau Laut adalah satu perkampungan nelayan. Pemperbatas komuniti di sini bergantung kepada hasil laut serta sungai dan bakau lah. Kalau pembelakan makin berluasan, petani akan panasan lah. Pastu hujan dia mungkin jarang-jarang sampailah yang musim kemarau, tak ada hujan apa semua tu. Setiap pendapatan itu juga kita tidak dapat yang macam terlampau banyak. Cuma untuk cukup makan untuk satu minggu, mana yang lain-lain untuk belanja budak-budak sekolah. Ha. Daripada study tour yang daripada ADB, banyak ilmu yang saya dapat tentang kebersihan, kesihatan, dari segi layanan itu turis. Segala latihan khusus-khusus yang dibagi dengan oleh ADB beri menambah baik pengalaman skill kita. Bermula dari situ kita develop satu ekotourism. Komuniti di sini kerjasama dengan kami, kami link sama-sama dengan orang membantu dong dari segi ekonomi di kawasan tempat-tempat dalam sini. Komuniti di sini telah membantu menjaga alam sekitar, terutamanya tentang marin dan cara penangkapan ikan yang listari lah. Eko pelancingan di Sabah ini dia sesuatu yang tiada titik nokta, dia sentiasa berkembang. Dengan eko pelancongan, ekonomi cara hidup penduduk kampung akan meningkat dan keluar daripada kepopongan kemiskinan. So I hope uh, the case study in Sabah shows you that the ecotourism brought in, right, um, actually satisfy many of the areas that we were talking about earlier. It is while giving uh, the, in, the local fishermen additional income, note it is additional, it's supplementary income, you're not encouraging them to give up their original job, which is fishing, in, and to hop on to uh, tourism as, uh, as their main job, but it gives them a supplement. And you can see very clearly without the supplementary income from tourism, what are what kind of a lifestyle are they are they experiencing? So if you actually go back, right, we are looking at this component here again. So through introduction of community-based ecotourism, okay, you're, you're targeting the poor, right? The fishermen, they, they mentioned very clearly looking at the surrounding, you can probably come to the same conclusion as well, they are poor, right? So these things when they add together, um it helps, right? They are trying to find a magical well, of point as well in this process. So is it successful? Right, these are things that uh, we need to consider when we have to put these things down on paper as part of the answers. Okay, 
Uh, secondly, measures to achieve aims of ecotourism. Uh, what can we do? Um, in the video, you 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 heard some of the local fishermen talk about what has been put in place for them. Things like uh, knowledge about hygiene conditions, knowledge about uh, hospitality management. How do you then approach tourists? How do you share your information with tourists? How do you make sure that whatever you feed the tourists doesn't give them diarrhea and then they have a very nasty experience? So these are things that you can teach the locals who are providing the tourist the tourism uh, experience. Similarly, you can also educate the tourists, right? Through education, you can increase their appreciation of nature and their increase and therein increase their demand for this particular type of tourism. Okay, so let's 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 bring ourselves one step back and look at our own situations, the kind of tourism that you have experienced or you have heard of around or, or that your friends or peers among you that have already been on right this past maybe 16, 15 years of their life so far. Okay? So what are the things that you need to do? If if you knew more about this and you were taught from a younger age to appreciate nature, not to just Oh, every time I go for a tour, I need to see some historical site. I must buy a billion things uh, for, for myself and for everybody back home, right? Instead, your, your tour can be one where you immerse yourself in nature and get the same, if not a higher level of satisfaction, okay? So what else can we do? We can put in place measures, of course, to minimize the negative impacts to the environment. So this can also come in the form of rules, regulations, training, awareness, right? The, uh, both for the tourist provider as well as for the tourist itself. Okay. So when your tours take place within the natural areas, this is a key problem, right? If they know and they appreciate more, they will naturally want to take action to minimize damage. This is self-fulfilling, right? So this is a self-fulfilling, self-regulating action by the tourists. Okay, so this is actually very, very powerful. Okay, this is very, very powerful. Okay, so you think about it. Uh, if you don't do this, right, what, what are the other means? Of course, we can do the Singapore way, which is impose very impose and enforce very strict fines, right? That will put people on their toes as well, and that will discourage people from doing the same thing. Now, is the end point the same? Yes. But uh, what is then, why, why is it that people prefer... Uh, this mode here where you increase tourist knowledge because it increases and it, it, it generally the experience for the tourists would be much better. Okay? Instead of having to worry about this and that, you are learning to appreciate and then self-regulate through your actions. So this is a much better, much more desirable outcome. Right, next, when you look at revenue, okay, uh, what can you do if you really, really want to target local communities, you really want to target for uh, the the pro poor uh, tourism right or pro poor pro poor yeah environment hire locals right hire the locals the the park rangers the people who run your facility the people who provide uh the homestay people who provide the training in terms of local craft and all hire locals this is very very important right by hiring local you're trapping the revenue uh from tourism receipts within the community itself Okay. It also makes the community uh, aware that this thing that they have been doing uh, actually can be a uh, supplement or can even be their main source of income moving forward. Okay, So this is important by ensuring that the monetary component is uh, set up and is uh, properly covered. You will then be able to be more sustainable in this way. Okay, And it's actually a natural form of sustainability that's and then developed. Okay, environment also, uh, if you if you then are able to do this properly and the environment is conserved, then you can then continue con to attract tourists, even repeat tourists, because in nature, things keep changing, right? Uh, and if it's still allowed to be kept in a more natural environment, the tourists can come and do repeat this as well. Okay, so if you're looking for examples, Galapagos Island in Ecuador, right? Here are some of the examples and some solid numbers that you guys love. Okay, uh, declared World Heritage Site in 1979. 1979 is a long, long time ago, right? So, um, most of the island's total area is a natural. It's a national park, 97% of it. So, what are some of the things they do? Entrance fee, 
very very important. This is a very high entrance fee, but this funds conservation. Okay. Second, uh, first one actually is limited numbers. So what is the perk of having limitation of numbers? Then you have less people, less re, uh, less resources of resources, less emissions of pollution, and the area is then better being able to be protected. Okay, and and on top of the entrance fee and limiting numbers, there's a guided tour. Okay, so it's compulsory that you go on guided tours of the islands. You're not allowed to island hop on your own and do your own damage to the ecology. You're always being uh, shepherd around by a guide. Okay, locals offer the homestay, so you're also targeting the local community, targeting community-based tourism, targeting the pro-poor tourism as well. So this is a wonderful example that you can think uh, that's offhand, right? That, that fits very nicely into this. Actually, there's a... <laughs> It isn't it isn't ecotourism. Okay, there's another place that you go to where everything is controlled as well. Okay, but it's not ecotourism. So you don't use it for ecotourism, for example. There's a visit to North Korea. Right? So there are also call groups that there are tour groups that uh, organize uh, trips to North Korea. Similarly, limited number of visitors allowed in the country a year. Similarly, entrance fee is very, very high. Um is it for conservation? It isn't. It isn't. It's I actually have no idea what it's used for, but I I would like to believe that it's part of the government's fund goes back into part of the government's funding as well. It's not cheap. It's not very expensive, but it's not cheap. Okay, and more importantly, it's compulsory. It's guided. You can't go anywhere else. You can't take random photos of random things when you're on that trip in North Korea, or you may get find yourself arrested and locked away in jail. Okay. Um. So, but in, okay, we come back to Galapagos Islands, right? This is a very good example. This is also in your SLS. Uh, guide so take a look at that now earlier on we talked about spectrum right so let's end on this idea of the ecotourism spectrum where where do you where do you slot your items in right so we look at examples of uh same factors right uh that that put that help us categorize what is hard ecotourism what's soft ecotourism so in terms of numbers of tourists if you are hardcore okay hard ecotourism, hardcore ecotourism right hard you have small numbers of tourists. Okay, the soft one being more comfortable, uh, you will have a larger number of tourists that will embark on that. Okay, um, in terms of commitment, why is it that you have small numbers? Largely, it's because you are more committed to the environment and to conservation, and as a result, the experience is a bit more back to nature, which is not what most regular tourists would be able to accept. So, in terms of hard eco tourism, your commitment level is much higher. Uh, in terms of soft tourism, there's still a commitment, but it is moderate. I wouldn't say it's low, but it's moderate. So you may be looking out for certain things like um hotels that have an ecotourism slant, right? But you, you would want to stay in a hotel. Okay, so you are the dependable type. Right? Once again, you're not the venturer type. The venturer type will want to live in the tent in uh Lake Kawaguchi facing Mount Fuji, tent with no hot water, no air conditioning, no nothing. Right, and you have to start your own campfire to cook your own food. Okay, in terms of services, right, if you're on the hard and hard ecotourism end, you will have very few services. Right, everything may be more physically demanding. You may have to carry your own tent. You may have to climb mountains. Uh, there is no roadway, no cable car. But if you're on the soft ecotourism side, of course, then uh, the experience is heavily serviced. Lah. So even if you're climbing up a, a hill, right, they may offer you a, a horse ride, a camel ride, you know, a rope, a ropeway, uh, or, or what you guys film a cable car up, okay? So in terms of the experience, physical experience, right, if you're on the hard tourism side, it's definitely going to be more challenging. If you're on the soft side, it's definitely going to be more comfortable, okay? Uh, who provides this, right? Because of the nature of, of the intensity and, and uniqueness and, and uh, expertise needed to conduct hard tourism, you will tend to have specialist tour operators. Operators who uh, offer niche travel, okay, tourists who make their own arrangements to book, uh, visit into natural parks, right, book camping locations in natural parks, etc., etc. But for the soft eco tourism side, you may be going to a more, uh, more civilized version, civilized portion of the natural park, and instead of camping overnight, you're just going there for a day, uh, maybe for just four five hours of hiking. So mass market tour operators will be able to provide that for you. Okay. So think of it this way, if you go to Kilimanjaro, climbing Kilimanjaro would be hard to tourism, right? Going to a uh, animal safari, uh, in the, watching the animals in the comfort of your, your mocked up van, right, or trailer, it would be 
more towards soft people tourism. Okay. Now, who prefers this? Of course, we come back to our original uh, topic one area where we took that adventurous type versus dependable type. It'd be good if we can administer and adhere those uh, labels to people who would prefer hard ecotourism and people who would prefer soft ecotourism. Okay, finally, limitations of ecotourism. Um, of course, there's the continuity efforts, it's not going to be very certain, right? If you change government, right? Like we talked about earlier, you change climate, you change uh, an ATE, or you change physical conditions. These are things that may, um, even though you try to keep everything else status quo, may impact the ability for you to continue conserving nature. Okay. Also, local communities, um, when you look at targeting poor, poor, uh, poor, pro poor tourism, right, or community-based tourism, uh, there is a problem. They don't become poor anymore, right? After maybe five, ten years of targeting them and giving them initiatives that help them, um, gain a foothold or move up the, the income chain, right? They're not poor anymore. So that that local community, the the second generation may not see the benefit of continuing with this unless your benefit, your value proposition also correspondingly increases. So this is very important. So these these are things that um we have to think about in terms of limitations. Right? Are they gonna be poor? Are they still poor? Okay, uh, continuing efforts, right? Sometimes too much of a good thing. You have too many visitors, your environmental impact is larger, and then the whole place is gone, right? Profit motivation is very important uh, to get people on board, but profit motivation very, very often overrides conservation considerations. Okay, when the money is flashed constantly in front of the fishermen, right, it's very, very common that they. Um, if you or they offer you a, a better service, uh, that may or may not have a larger impact on the environment. And then these are the things that will uh, impact your conservation efforts. Okay? Always remember, we've, I've mentioned this many times in class, money talks. Okay? So communities, once again, sometimes it isn't even because they are not poor anymore. Sometimes they just have that amount of local manpower. So when you have an increase in demands, right? Um, you, you to meet the sheer number of uh, providers, you may need to have non-local manpower. Okay, the locals may not have the necessary training, and they do not always have uh, NGOs that come in. I like okay, I bring you back to our Sarah video just now. Sarah video, sorry, right? Uh, where the NGO came in and trained the locals on things like hospitality, things like uh, health and hygiene, right? So these are things that if there's no such body coming in to train the locals, then it's gone forever. Right, there's no way to make up for this at all. Right? Finally, economic leakages, uh, lots of tourism receipts. This is very common when you have non-locals, but either companies or individuals who are then taking part in these uh, local tourism segments. Okay. So uh, the next video will move on and we'll continue working on community-based tourism. What I've covered so far today is the assessment of ecotourism as a tool, as one of the approaches. Right, there are perks, there are benefits, and of course there are limitations to this. Okay, so these are three very quickly, uh, these are three very, very clear approaches that can be compared directly, right, and can in can end up uh, showing you this this kind of uh, comparison, which one is more effective, or is there a way where you will all three together and meet the Goldilocks point here? Okay, so I'll see you in the next video.